Do we have any citizens from this, Doctor? No, sir, we do not. Do we have anybody here from leadership hall? No. All righty. Uh, Same uh, motion to approve from a three and four. We have a motion to that. Doctor, we do the end consent agenda by Mr. Smith, the second by Mr. Mitchell. All those in favor? All right, uh, Mr. Green, you were up. As Mr. Green makes his way up, uh, graduation has come very quickly for us this school year. It is three weeks from this past Friday. So it's getting here. Mr. Green just want to give us an update of where we are uh, at the high school and kind of some of the things that are going up these last few weeks. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good to be here. Uh, I mean that here today, but also here the point where we can talk about graduation being only a few weeks away. Um, it's been a, uh, a long school year, uh, but we're finally in a position where we can give our students and their families some clarity on how we're going to celebrate the end of the year. I want to share that with you today. Uh, so for graduation itself, we're going to hold a traditional commencement ceremony at City Park in Gainesville uh, on Friday, May 21 at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we have <clears throat> made the decision to limit each family to six tickets. Uh, we felt that uh, initially we kind of sent out a message that we would be limiting tickets and the number could be four uh, per family, but we felt given uh, current levels of community spread, we're able to increase that to uh, six tickets per family, uh, and that puts us at about 65 to 70 percent capacity at City Park State. We feel really good with that number. We're also using the airline rules for younger children, they're under two and can fit in your arms and they don't need, and that allows some families to bring the back people that they need. We are requesting that everyone that attends brings uh, to enter City Park will need to have a mask, um, <clears throat> and we will uh, be making frequent reminders uh, to everybody. Uh, regarding social distancing and mask wearing. Uh, graduates uh, will stage as usual uh, over at First Baptist. Um, we'll be able to park there up until 5.45 and then we'll open up to everybody. Um, we, we will, we will uh, process across Green Street as a tradition, enter and take field. Uh, we'll have graduate space about three feet apart, uh, which will take up quite a bit of room as you can imagine. So we're really excited to do that. Uh, we're not going to talk about rain, uh, but if our hand is forced, we're going to uh, look to try and do it on Saturday evening. Um, if that's not clear, then we'll try to go Saturday morning outside of City Park. And if weather really doesn't want to work with us, we have an indoor plan. But uh, as long as it is not torrential downfall, we can expect graduation outside. Uh, in addition uh, to the uh, approximately 450 graduates uh, that will be celebrating from the class of 2021. We'll also be recognizing three recipients of the honorary diploma. Uh, we had six nominees this year, uh, and each and every one of them was very qualified um, and, and deserving. Uh, but the uh, Gainesville High School School Governance Council met, reviewed using the rubric that we developed uh, and selected three recipients. Uh, the first is Scott McGarry, William Scott McGarry. Uh, he's a graduate of Georgia Tech and Central Gwinnett High School. Uh, he's founded his own business here in town. Uh, and despite uh, the commitment that that brings, he's found time uh, over the decades to serve on numerous boards. North uh, Georgia Health System, uh, Center Point, Kiwanis Club. He's been a key club advisor at the high school. He's coached youth sports for over 16 years. Uh, he sponsored our REACH Scholars, and uh, probably most impressively was his 16-year term on the chain crew uh, Gainesville High School football. So we're really excited to celebrate uh, Mr. McGarry. The next is Betty Livingston. She's from, so she graduated Hollywood High School in Saluda, South Carolina, and attended Winthrop College. Uh, she taught English for five years, uh, in Augusta, Georgia, I believe, uh, and then became a stay-at-home mom. But then returned teaching and served 40 years as a sub-teacher. And we know how hard it is to find a sub. <laughs> so for somebody to commit 40 years 
uh, to substitute teaching is, is just unheard of. Uh, and very dependable, uh, came in every day, brought energy, got to know the students, even just as a sub, you know, she knew the students' names. We try to do the math, you know, it's easy, fairly easy for a teacher, you know, you can say, all right, you've taught 150 students a year, you've done 10 years, it equals that amount of students, but for a sub, it's hard. You know, she might well see four or 500 students a year over the course of 40 years. Uh, so she's touched the lives of many young people. Um, her children graduated from Gainesville High School, her grandchildren graduated from Gainesville High School, and to this day, she's a very keen supporter of all that we do. So we're excited to recognize her. Our third uh, recipient is Mr. John Naaman Lilly III, uh, graduate of Jonesboro High School in Georgia, where his dad was a high school principal. Uh, he graduated UGA. Uh, the, there's a little confusion in the story, whether it was his wife or his college roommate that convinced him to come to Gainesville. Um, it's an old hope. It was a lot. His his roommate, um, but uh, when he moved to Gainesville, John quickly became a fan of all things and a supporter of all things Gainesville. His children, of course, attended Gainesville City Schools, um, but he served as a mentor to numerous kids. Uh, he and his company have sponsored our school board. He's been the president, I think, for seven years of the Tip Off Booster Club. Uh, he's come in and spoken to classes, presented to classes, both at the high school and the middle school. Um, he is now on the chain crew uh, of, of the high school football team. Uh, and one of the things I think is most impressive about him uh, is that whenever he is in the book, if he's in that building for 25 seconds to drop something off, he says hi to four or five kids. And he knows who they are and they know who he is. And that goes a long way. Um, he's also, interestingly, going to be receiving his diploma the same night as his daughter. And we think that's a really neat thing to be able to do. Uh, so those are our honorary diploma, uh, honorary diploma recipients. We're very excited for a ceremony that will take place on Friday, uh, 21st of May at 7.30 City Park, and I'm open to any questions you have. You said approximately 450 graduates. Around that number, yes, sir. We will, of course, be with you on the for graduation. And uh, do you have the details on back of all that? Yes, sir. Um, Liquid Baptist Church at 10 a.m. on the 14th, 15th. 15th of May. Rehearsals on the 14th in the evening. It's a lot of events, I'm sorry. Saturday morning. Saturday morning is the baccalaureate, 10 a.m., 15th. And on the 14th is the rehearsal at 5 p.m. This is a fairly early ending to the school year for us. Uh, next year it's a little bit later, so it does seem like there's a lot of events back in. It is. A we, of time. Yes, so we have EOC testing over the next two weeks, AP testing over the next two weeks, and we're trying to get everything in at the end of the year as well. And, and trying to collect 4,000 Chromebooks between middle and high. But, and, <laughs> yes, sir. Collect <laughs> Chromebooks. <laughs> So, Mr. Green, to add one more uh, thing on your to-do list, I know last year, because we weren't going to have the public graduation, we did the drop-by yes, celebration, which seemed to be really popular. Was, was there any discussion given to maybe continue in that tradition? Lots of discussion, yes, sir. Um, we, we finally worked through the logistics of it. You know, this year with the construction, we've lost a lot of space and the flow that really worked to safely get the vehicles in and out. So we've had to completely redesign the route. Um, we have two options that we're looking at. Um, one is on the uh, on the 14th, which is the same day that we're doing yearbook distribution, uh, and we're doing um, signing day. So after school, when the AP exams are finished, we uh, would host potentially on that on that day, the 14th, the the drive through. The other option is that Monday, but we also don't want to put that in conflict with the board meeting. So we're just trying to work uh, work through. Um, some of those logistical issues, and we'll have an answer for Dr. Williams tomorrow morning. All subject to change based on weather. All subject to change based on weather. Yes, sir. Any other questions? For graduation, it's supposed to be now at seven. Seven will work for us. Uh, we will walk out, uh, of course, early. We do not yet know how we'll be set up on the stage given some of the other visits and restrictions that we have in place. So uh, we've got some conversations we need to do to, to make sure we're 
be responsible as well. Yeah, there will be no assistant principals on the stage. Uh, we'll take care of what's to be. So we'll be able to spread out. All right. Any other questions? Thanks, Mr. Green. Thank you. One thing that you'll notice as you came in, it's at your table, but also on the floor, if anybody's interested, grab one. Uh, Joy Griffin has been with us now almost a month. I guess you have been, it's been a full month now. Um, you'll notice a graduation ad that will go out in the Gainesville Times a week from actually this upcoming Saturday, uh, that it will be in the Gainesville Times. So you'll see some great information there about uh, a valedictorian, which will be announced later this week, uh, but also the schools our graduates have been accepted to across the country. Just a phenomenal, phenomenal class. Just really proud being able to honor them over these next few weeks. So just be able to look out for that hitting uh, print, but also uh, online news as well as social media. As well. All right, uh, Mrs. Pethel, you discuss our most recent financial audit for fiscal year 2020. Good evening. It's my pleasure to present to you this evening. Uh, final results for FY20. Uh, financial audit report. Uh, we did receive an unmodified opinion on that, which is what we were looking for. Uh, there were no uh, findings or no significant uh, violations or misstatements. So um, we do have a clean audit report for FY20. Motion to accept with gratitude. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to take this opportunity to thank the board and Dr. Williams and Mr. Miles for all the support that we get continually uh, for the finance week. We could certainly not accomplish it and do that without all the support from everyone. So, truly appreciate it. Low risk again. Low risk again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I had a motion. Uh, I didn't think it was necessary, but. In spirit, that's in ceremony, let's so accept the positive. With <laughs> we got a motion by Mr. Smith. We got a, so we got a second by Dr. Randy. All those in favor. Thank you again. Formally. Uh, also, if you will talk about the uh, schedule for our upcoming budget adoption. Sure. Um, we will have on May 17th that our regular session uh, we'll be able to present to the board a tentative budget adoption and a tentative millage rate um, uh, for your um, tentative adoption. And prior to that, we will be publishing on a website uh, all of this information. Um, it's not required to publish in a paper, in a newspaper, but we will be publishing that on the website. Um, and then the upcoming required hearing uh, that we'll have, depending on you know, the millage rate and adoption that we um, will present, we'll be publishing that in the newspaper uh, seven days prior to June 14th. So uh, that will be on June 6th. We'll be publishing that in the newspaper. And then the first hearing will be on June the 14th at 6 p.m. And then we will be publishing again seven days prior to the June 21st meeting, which will be on June 13th, publishing the newspaper. And then the final two hearings will be on June 21st at 11 a.m. and at 5 p.m. Uh, just prior to the regular work session. I mean, regular um, work session. So if you look at these times, they, they kind of look scattered, but we are required to have hearings at certain times of the day to make it available to people who may be working uh, based on certain times of the day. Uh, also, uh, we are required to have three budget hearings regardless of what we do with the military. So the last two to three years now, we've combined those to just do them all at the same time, uh, which has, has benefited as well. So that's why you see kind of a combination of, we have to have three hearings for the budget, yeah, depending on if we accept anything other than the rollback, the lower of the millage rate, we would have to have two required hearings there. So instead of five, let's do three and combine them and, and make it worthwhile for the citizens uh, to be able to provide comment. Yeah, and, and during the, the newspaper publishing, so you know, that'll be required uh, notice of uh, tax increase if that's the case, and we'll have our five year history uh, that we'll publish as well as all the budget. 
Um, just a quick question with the time someone's publishing twice a week, uh, they I assume have issued you as deadlines. Yes, and that would be the Sunday. Um, but the Wednesday would not fulfill the seven days uh, required, so it would be the yeah, Sunday. It's Saturday. It's Wednesday, Saturday. Saturday, okay. Yeah. Yeah. On Saturday, yeah. Yeah. Which gives us an excess of uh, seven days. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Uh, Spencer. Did you, did you print those out for us? Did you print that schedule? Would be important. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Next item up uh, action items the annexation of 259 Gould Drive. At the last board meeting, uh, the board you approved me to move forward with the closing of that property. It is adjacent to the existing middle school property, uh, and we needed it. Uh, based on some of the topography there. Uh, so we did close on that uh, almost two weeks ago now, and now we would like to move forward with the question annexing that property into the city to join the rest of the property. Got a motion? Okay. Motion by Mr. Gordon. Okay. Second by Dr. Randy. Any questions, comments? All those in favor? All right, Ms. Bethel, you're back up for uh, right off of the 2013 and 2014 personal property taxes. Yes, this is a request from the city of Gainesville. Um, they typically do this annually. Uh, if we have from last year, but this is one we have two this year. Uh, right off of uh, personal property taxes, and the amount to the district is $30,572. Got a motion by Mr. Smith. Okay. Got a second by Dr. Ramsey. Any questions? What, one question I had about this is so, with this money that we're writing off, is this currently showing up as a basically a tax receivable? Or no, is it? There's, no, there's no actual uh, write off to us because we never recorded the revenue. Yeah, so it's just. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Motion carries. Uh, Ms. Bethel, if you will discuss the FY21 budget amendment. The first uh, budget amendment is for the general fund. And basically, the first step is for the revenues. Uh, we're re recognizing the bottom line additional revenues of $3.8 million. Um, and most of that is made up of the additional um, midterm for the QBE. Uh, I did go through and make some adjustments for the additional uh, abnormal taxes that we received to date and um, additional TABT and some other adjustments that we're aware of at this time. So, um, what was our midterm allocation? Uh, everything netted together about 2.5. And that's mainly due to uh, the austerity that was put into this year's budget. We received 60% of that back in the midterm from the budget. That was where those, that was why we had such an increase. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Even the last year going into the school year with uh, the funding, we were cut. What was originally around 14% on up to around 10%. Okay. They gave us 60% of what was cut back mid year. Okay. So all good stuff for us. Of the 10%. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And that would be the same going into next year. We'll continue with that funding going into next year. And hopefully, midterm next year, we'll get more of that 40% of that 10% that's still out there. Let's say uh, looking at the expenditures um, around a $10,000 uh, $10, increase in expenditures uh, at this point. And that's just, um, conservatively speaking, uh, at this point, we may have some further reductions. Uh, but basically, at the um, affecting our fund balance at this time, uh, that is additional. Um, Positive to the fund balance of 64,000. So we're looking at a projected ending fund balance of 20 million 167. So that's so it's the second page of the first, first page. Yeah, right here. 
Um, so basically that's due to the um, increase in revenues. So um, very roughly speaking, uh, we could be ending up at a tracking limit. Motion to approve the amendment. There are motions by Mr. Smith that we need to discuss. Do we want to do this together? All right, go. Yeah. The second is for federal um, budget amendment. And here uh, we're just recognizing the difference between what we originally budgeted for the federal programs and what the awards of uh, came in at um, the lead year. So just remember, federal funds, the money that comes in has to go out. That's why you see those revenue expenditures exactly. in the same amount. Exactly. All right, Mr. Smith, would you like to make a motion on both? All right. Mr. Smith, second. Okay, we got a motion by Mr. Smith, second by Mr. Mitchell. All those in favor to accept both reports. Thank you. Uh, now. <laughs> Uh, we have learned that we will be unable to receive the full order of HP Chromebooks that I came to you much earlier in October and requested. Um, we are only going to be short about 400, but we do need to make an adjustment in our plan as a result of that. So we located a Dell 2 and one that will do exactly what the HP Chromebook uh, would do, and it is available. We know it's in stock, so we won't have any problem uh, with getting it. And um, we also had a great opportunity come up in that we had um, some extra funds from L4GA that became available for us to be able to purchase even beyond those 400 that we need to replace. So by buying those extra devices, we'll be able to provide one touch device for every one of our elementary school classrooms, not just kindergarten or pre-K, kindergarten and first grade, where we will give those to every student. So each teacher will have a touch Chromebook, a tablet that they can use. They can mirror it to their uh, front of classroom projection, which gives them some neat ability to be able to write on that and do activities with that um, in the classroom. It will also be a great uh, tool for them to use in modeling activities that they're going to ask their students to do. So I am coming before you tonight to request the board approve the purchase of 684 Dell 2-in-1 Chromebooks at a total cost of $244,838, of which $151, uh, excuse me, $151,638 will be paid for with the L4GA funds. $93,200 will continue to come from the CARES funds where we had originally requested those funds to pay for the <coughs> HP. And just to be clear, we never paid HP any money because we had not received those devices. So we're not, we're not out anything. So the money that we had already approved for the initial devices is, is part, part of this. this. You're yes. basically re-approving that. That 93,000 is what you had approved last time and you're re, you know, just letting you know that it's we're still really allocating right. that, yes. And, and we're adding more devices, um, mainly because the l 4 j was the literacy grant funds. We have to expend those by the end of June. And we know that these uh, Chromebooks are ready to be delivered, so that way we won't have to worry about sending any money, any help for you money back to the second plan. And so it's an opportunity to just add value to some of the funds that are remaining as a part of that literacy grant. And what is your timeline? We will have all devices here by before June 30th. In fact, I expect pending your approval to be able to place that order tomorrow so that we would be able to receive devices in, in as few as a couple weeks. So I know for myself, if there's, you're teaching me on one device or the teacher has one device and I have a different device, I would get confused. 
The operating system is exactly the same. All the screens are exactly the same. Okay. The only difference is, is that as a teacher, when I'm in front of you, I can hold that device like it's a tablet and be able to use my finger no matter where I'm standing in the room. I'm sorry, the extra 400 that you're talking about? Um, the 400 that we're replacing will be for our youngest students okay. who are not yet quite ready to do keyboarding. Right. So and they'll have that touch it. experience. Okay. okay. And then the extra ones that we purchase will be for the teachers so they have that ability to kind of be anywhere in the classroom, but yet be able to mirror and show an activity on screen that they can model for kids what to do or use it as they're observing around in the classroom. Motion to approve. Got a motion by Mr. Smith. So, Mr. Norville first. So, second by Mr. Norville. All those in favor? All right, Mr. Norville. I've got a sidebar question. Yes, sir. Uh, somebody just said you're about to collect home books. <laughs> Yes, sir. We'll be collecting Chromebooks from our middle and high school students and taking those up at the end of the year so that we can refurbish them and get them ready for distribution as we go into the next year. We learn from working with many other school districts that allowing students just to keep them sometimes ends up with them being in worse shape than if we check them every year and get them re-ready for distribution. So Mr. Green and Ms. Freeman are working along with us and we have a, a plan to be able to collect those as close to the very end of the year as possible. What about the Chromebooks that the elementary kids have? So the Chromebooks the elementary kids have generally are staying in the classroom, but they're using them. Um, they're not necessarily taking those home every day. Okay. Um, our students who are in Gainesville Virtual Academy will be returning their devices on the 20th and 21st after school ends, because of course, we pick up the Chromebook with them, they really can't do anything. Um, so we'll take those up after the last day of school. They'll be returning them to the middle school and we will be providing them with notification very shortly to let them know about that process. And our summer school students? So we will have devices available in the building for students to use. We will not be issuing devices for students to take home. Um, all that said, we, we know that there will probably be a limited amount of use of those Chromebooks this <laughs> summer uh, during summer school, and that's due to a number of factors, including the fact that we are transitioning our student information system, and that um, is, help, is causing some things for us to do as far as rostering is concerned and application access. So we've again worked with the school so they're ready to um, take care of what they'll have available versus not available. You'll see the Chromebooks used more in the summer program at middle and high. We've encouraged all of them to have, you know, summer school, when you typically hear summer school, does not sound very engaging, but we've asked the schools to make it very engaging. Uh, if a kid is coming to school in the summer, sit in front of the computer, we're not being successful at the school. So it does not conflict with us taking the Chromebooks over. What is the advertised lifespan of a new home? We have Chromebooks under warranty. The HPs are under warranty for three years. Um, we will probably try to get a little more than three years. Again, working with my colleagues around the state who are also issued Chromebooks in a one-to-one -one setting, we're typically seeing four or five years. Now, some of my colleagues right here in the same county will try to get even seven years out of it. One thing that we are looking at budgeting is knowing that now CARES 1, CARES 2, and the ARP funds are available up through September 2024, being able to use the back end of that funding to replace what we need to replace in the district. So hopefully it didn't have to come out of some of the funds that we, that we, that we use on a year-year basis. Um, so we will be doing possibly the same thing with teacher laptops as well. Uh, so we're going through the rules and regulations of all the CARES funds, what's allowable and what's not, and, and looking how it can help our general fund budget, which is what it's intended to do, is how can it help school systems meet learning loss uh, while at the same time um, not putting such a burden on districts uh, during, during the pandemic. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Green. 
custodial services back March 1st. Uh, again, uh, last year we had put it out on the street and then of course COVID, uh, COVID happened and we pulled it back in. And so we put it back out this year. Uh, our current company has been with us now, counting last year is six years. Uh, the last two years was a year to year. Um, and we felt system-wide and feedback from principals and uh, uh, school nutrition staff and other people uh, throughout the district felt as though it was time to rebid. And so we put it back out on the street in March. March 1st, went through the state procurement uh, procedures. Um, we did a, a mandatory walkthrough. All of our companies showed up. We did a walkthrough of buildings. We had a total of 14 companies to submit a bid proposal uh, based on our RFP. Uh, we narrowed it down. We had a seven person uh, committee that included two principals. Uh, so we narrowed it down, uh, those 14 companies, uh, based on two criteria, of course, one is cost. And the second one was we did a rubric for overall response to the RFP. Uh, we, we interviewed two companies, uh, his facilities, LLC out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and Intercontinental Commercial Services out of Lawrenceville. Well, I'm gonna be two because the third company was $2 million above uh, Hess, and then they were in the general rubric, they were number five. So we only interviewed the two companies. And after going through the interview process, uh, the selection of the committee, uh, just to recommend Hess Facilities, uh, LLC out of Knoxville, Tennessee, uh, for, the, for a three-year term, uh, $5,607,030.29. <coughs> uh, starts on July 21st of this year, goes through June of 2024. Um, we've already shared with them, and I'll ask uh, Russ real quickly, come up shortly, and introduce his team. But one of the things that, uh, that we've talked about, we know that we've got a short window uh, this summer for cleaning our buildings as all of our schools will have summer school. Our new teachers will come back. A new teacher will report third week in July. So it gives us that short window. So we've, we've, talked, to, we've talked to all of our companies about our schedule and everything. And we believe again that HES is going to be able to come in and really make a difference in our, our buildings, uh, the way that they look, the cleanliness of them, and really uh, <coughs> put forth a balanced effort to really get them uh, up to par and up to speed. Um, we've also talked to them about the requirements that Game City School System has always had uh, for companies that come in and do business with us. One of them is that they would uh, have a physical local office. Two, that they, of course, would obtain a local business license. Three, that they would hire from the local community. I've also sent an email to all of our principals asking for them their list of current uh, ADM employees that they wish would stay employed and stay in their buildings. And so we've gotten that list from the principals. We're passing that list on to Hess so that we make sure that those number of employees stay employed. Third thing that they'll do is that they'll hit the ground running and they'll host a job fair. They'll host several if they have to. Uh, the goal is to get us up to speed, up to uh, full capacity as for staff. And our current company has just not been able to really get us up to staff for about six, nine months or so. Any questions, Mr. Knowles? Mr. Knowles, I had a couple of questions, and I don't sure. know if maybe this would be a question for the HES team, but um, with a with an engagement like this, 
are they in here? Are they coming in every night? Is it on weekends? Like, how, just logistically, how does that work? Okay. Typically? Yeah. Of course, first it starts with day porters. Uh, each school has an allotted number of day porters based on uh, school capacity, that's staff and students, uh, and then based on uh, what individual teach school says that they need. One school may say that, you know, given our size and everything, we need four day porters. One other schools, elementary schools may only need three day porters. So day porters will come in 6 a.m., work through 2.30, 3 o'clock. Then you'll have uh, the night porters who'll come in and they'll work through, you know, 9, 10 o'clock if necessary to get the building clean. So you got two shifts. Uh, they also work events, uh, games in gym, basketball games, volleyball games. They make sure locker rooms is clean, bleachers are clean. Uh, so they also do in a system function uh, activity that's on the campus over the weekend, a theater presentation or what have you. So that's all in their contract as well. Yeah. <coughs> Question. Motion to approve the contract. Okay. Got a motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Second by Mr. Smith. All those in favor? Great. Mr. Chairs. Great. Let me ask Russell just real quickly. He'll just come up and introduce uh, introduce himself uh, to you all. And uh, just real quick, quickly, Russ, just share with our superintendent, our board, the commitment that you guys have made to us during our interview process. Um, hold on, is it okay to take this yeah. off? Okay, uh, just while we're talking. Uh, I'd like to introduce my team. My name is Russell Leibach, by the way. I'm Vice President of Business Development. Nick Chris is our regional manager, and Dave Williams is our area manager. Um, I want to commend your school system for the, the process that utilized the company. And I'm not saying that just to cozy up to Adrian, because I'm not scared of him. I'm scared of his principles. No, <laughs> they're, they're the ones I need to be concerned about. I don't need to be concerned about him. Um, but they, they went through a very uh, good process to select a company. Instead of having a company, the companies come in and do pony, dog and pony shows, a presentation about who they are and what they do, we sat for an hour and a half rapid fire interview questions from their, their staff. That's not easy. And these were real questions. I mean, these were questions like, why do you want to do business with Gainesville City Schools? And what are your challenges and weaknesses as a company? <laughs> these were really hard questions. So it's absolutely the way you should choose any provider for your school system. We were very impressed by the process. Uh, what I will tell you is our company takes this very personally. I think the majority of us are products of public education. And if if I'm working with you a year from now and you don't come up to us and say our school system is a better school system because of our partnership, then I don't feel like we did our job. And I'm not very happy about what I do for them. So that's the commitment you'll get from us. We take it first. You'll, you'll get a good program from us. You have my work. You have our work. Any questions? Glad to have you on board. Are you yeah, in, in Georgia in other systems yet? Paulding County, we've been serving for quite some time, okay. uh, but we have a, over 150 education partners nationwide. We're in 22 states. We're growing very, very fast. Uh, one of the problems that you have with private companies who come in and serve their school system is over time they get complacent. It's kind of like being married. You know, you get married, you have the honeymoon, you're newlyweds, everything's great. Then after a while, the marriage is not going so well. You know, you're not bringing her flowers or him. You know, you're not doing anything for him anymore. So we don't want to get complacent like that. Now, these guys think I have a marriage problem. I'm always using marriage. <laughs> yeah, I don't. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah. I've been married 33 years. Happily, I have a great marriage. I'm just satisfied. I have a great marriage. So uh, we want to have a great marriage with you. We don't want you just to be satisfied. We want you to be wowed. We want you to enjoy, to enjoy the partnership and relationship. How, how does your management work? So you'll obviously have people in our in our schools, and you mentioned that you have re regional oversight and area oversight. Are there managers that are coming in and, and sort of working with those people on a weekly basis, monthly basis? It's like, how does that? That's right. I'll let Nick and Dave talk to that. So that's to answer your question, it'll be a weekly basis. So I'll be the regional manager for uh, Gainesville City Schools, and you'll have an account manager that's dedicated to this account. Because, of course, their job is to be in there meeting with the principals day in and day out, whether it's during the day and the evening events, of course, all that they're ensuring it as addressed. Um, and then I'm here for support. And of course, we have a, you know, some folks that work out there for corporate that come in and they help out with HR type stuff and, and safety and things of that nature, make sure we're all up to par. And then, and then Dave is one of our area managers. Dave, 
And I, I just be here for whatever support they need, wherever they need me to be, that's what I'll be. Uh, Dave has a great relationship with Paul County. So if you know anybody in Paul, if you ask about Dave, they'll, they'll say good things about him. I think. <laughs> <laughs> so anything else we can answer for you? We're looking forward to it. Good luck in the hiring process. <laughs> yeah, so I will just give you it, it is, and, and what it means is that when, when things get tough, you gotta put more resources on it. You gotta, you gotta uh, you know, really go out there. And you got to sell what your company offers to people. And I think what we offer is a better uh, relationship, a better situation. Because when you're not highly compensated, I don't care if you're a teacher, police officer, custodian, you need to get a lot of respect at work. Uh, people need to respect you. They need to return your phone calls. You need to have equipment that works when you try to use it. So what we do is we try to give our team a lot of respect. And in turn, when we do that, they want to stay with us. So I'll just give you two quick examples. Palatine, Virginia, we just started services with them in December. They were at 49% um, staff when we started. They're now 97% staff. They'll tell you that number if you don't believe it. Um, Beaufort, South Carolina, right down the road here. We went in there, they were 79% staff. They are now 98% staff. So we're gonna come in here and we're gonna utilize the resources we have, but if we have to get more resources, we will. If we have to work harder, we'll work harder. But we're gonna improve your staff. You have a word on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, do we have any uh, discussion items? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're as we get for the end of the school year, would it be possible for us to get a vaccination recast uh, in terms of numbers? Uh, would it also be possible to collect some random? Uh, Reasons, if, if this is legal, I'm curious about random reasons for the vaccines. to solicit that it is still an issue of health safety. So we can definitely give you some numbers. I think if it's anonymous, then it's not a HIPAA violation. Anonymous is fine. And we'd be able to give you the number of people we vaccinated at our event, but beyond that, we don't know unless we've been told. And so, um, yeah, if you ask me on an anonymous survey that Jill could do, I would add I, my, my vaccine came through my physician and I would answer you um, without great detail, you <clears throat> know, but I would answer you if, if that is. We still have health safety uh, issues, and that's what prompts my question. So, what, what I'd like to add to that is as we welcome the end of school and summer and going into next school year, we don't feel like we're in the position yet to talk about next year as far as what some of the procedures would look like. Uh, we will be working on that over the next couple of months. I'm seeing how CDC guidelines change. And so, the more uh, vaccinations that we have, the more we hear about our families having success, the more our numbers stay down, the more freedom I think we would have to be able to make some of those adjustments. So we do know that we'll be opening some things up to what extent yet we still we still won't know for a couple of months. Thank you. My second question is that uh, will the team put us a season recap of our high school illustration uh, activities? Uh, let's let us know how we have done in the school year. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a uh, motion to adjourn it to executive. Motion to adjourn it to executive. A motion by Mr. Smith. Second by Dr. Randy. All those in favor?